people, 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 you know who it is, Arsenio Buck reporting live from Bangkok. Welcome back to the Arsenio Buck Show. I did a wonderful podcast yesterday with one of my 15-year-old uh, protege or prodigy students who are uh, who's basically coming up in the world. She's doing a lot of different things. So be sure to check that one out because that one is very intriguing listening to a 15-year-old here in Thailand through her perception of actually creating a lot of healthy meals and doing what she's doing right now. So that was a good day yesterday. Two podcasts. We're getting into Lisa Nichols today. Now this relates to just about everyone versus Tony Robbins, which could be very, very extensive and very, very difficult to understand. But uh, yesterday, listen, yesterday, well, I had a crazy squat session. I was in the gym just going crazy. I swear. I, I Man, I don't know what was going on, but I was just up, down, up, down, up, down. People were looking at me and I was like rapping. It was just craziness, right? So afterwards, <clears throat> my legs, oh my goodness. So I got a massage because I still have like a massage package at one of my places. And it's crazy because... During my massage, I actually do a chakra meditation, right? And I remember before she flipped me over to my top side, because normally I'm laying with my stomach down on the bed. But before that, I entered, it felt like I entered a room. I don't know what this room was, but I swear. It just felt like time was still. It was literally a black room. I don't know what it was, but during this meditation, this was like the furthest I've ever got inside of a a meditation to whereas there was there was nothing. There were no beliefs. There was nothing happening around me. Everything from my present life was completely blocked out of this specific room or whatever it was. And I was able to just be grateful in that set of time because I remember I then I remember feeling her hands. It was weird because it was like for what for about 10 minutes, I didn't feel her hands whatsoever. But after that, I remember her sitting me up and I and I opened my eyes and I was like, whoa, what was that? But I was in such an I was in a euphoric, a euphoric state of mind. I was so happy and so content with everything. So when I actually walked out of that massage place, I felt like a million dollars. That was probably the furthest I've ever gotten with the chakra meditation. Huge shout out to Mr. Graham Harrell for making that one. Uh, And again, it's like a 50-minute meditation. I had a one-hour massage. So it was just perfect. And I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't. But that was an incredible massage. Luckily, I even got a massage after that workout. And I'm going to hit it hard again. Because Tough Butter is approaching, but with that being said, people, it's time, it is time to get into some more Lisa Nichols. You know what, you guys are going to have to need, you, you guys are going to need some uh, some paper and a pencil. So I want you to get that right now. So what I'm going to do, we're going to do an exercise, okay? Lisa actually uses this in her teachings and her trainings to help people release past influences, all right? So to begin the process of eliminating these negative money beliefs. Now, again, if you guys do not know what I've been talking about, the geographical, the economical, the religious, all these different types of hindrances that really stop us and they continue to stop us or continue to stop you from actually making money because of what happened when you were as a child. Well, you guys are going to have to listen to those podcasts. But for a lot of people who have been listening to me already and really love the Lisa Nichols podcast, let's get right into this because... Again, gender, geographical, all that stuff. What you're going to do, you're going to take out a piece of paper and you're going to begin thinking back, okay? Begin thinking back. Piece of paper, you're going to start writing down stuff. Now, such as these questions, okay? You might have to download this so you could, you know, continue on with this particular exercise later on in the day if you don't have time. But if you have time right now and you're listening right now, Let's go through these questions. So, what was happening in your household around money during childhood? How did your parents react to financial stressors? Now, remember, I told you guys my story. The water got cut off at some point uh, when I was a kid. Uh, I had to wear water shoes to school. I remember I wanted the Kobe Bryants when he first came to the NBA back in 1996. And my dad was like, I ain't got any money. So you could tell how did my parents react to financial stressors and stuff like that. I mean, you could just feel the bad energy. But you're going to be asking these questions to yourself. What did your parents do with your money? How did they spend it? 
How did they talk to you about money? Were you granted your requests for money or was there never enough for your needs? Were they responsible or irresponsible with their money? Now these questions, when you now when you started earning an allowance or generating a small income from odd jobs, babysitting or a paper route, or what did you do with your money? So example, 1999, I remember my father had gotten into a real big argument with the guy upstairs. And I remember that guy was so scared to the point he felt the need to actually offer me a job. So he said, hey, listen, just check my door. If there's trash outside, take the trash to the thing. I'll know that you have done it, and I'll give you five dollars. And so that's that. And how would I spend my money? I would just buy a bunch of candy, because I guess you know when you get money, you want to spend it. That's kind of how my household was, and that's kind of how Lisa Nichols was too. I'll get into that real soon. Uh, were your parents in agreement with your money decisions, or did they disagree with your actions? My brother made up a lie. Back in 1999, my mom, we were having a lunch in the car because my mom, she didn't own the rights to keeping us. She didn't have custody of us. It was unfortunately my father, which was really terrible. But um, I remember my brother was so jealous at the fact that I had money. See, everything, these influences, the reason why me and my brother no longer talk is because of all these past influences with money. When I was making money, my brother would make up excuses and lies. He actually said the guy upstairs was a drug addict. And my mom was like, I don't want you taking out his trash anymore. I was like, Mom, but why? And my brother was so jealous because I was getting money and he wasn't. So the relationship between money is what pretty much destroyed the relationship between me and my brother or my brother and I. And it's crazy because if I I actually, I'm looking back on this right now. I never really thought about it until this point. But if I really look at it this particular way, my brother was – there was always money involved some, from the very beginning. And it was always like, oh, he gets this. I don't get this. I get this. He, he doesn't get this. I'm happy. It was always some jealousy and some envy going on with my brother. So now that I think about it, that's what you have to write down, okay? Were your parents in agreement with your money-making decisions? My mom wasn't. My brother wasn't because I was, I was getting money and he wasn't. So he wasn't happy. And the thing is, in a household where there wasn't really much food because my dad didn't, my father didn't really take care of us, if I got money, that means food in my stomach and no food in my brother's stomach. I mean, think about it that way. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? So what I want you to do, just jot down all those remembrances, okay, about money growing up. Group in your memories into the five categories, okay? So there's going to be a list like this. Remember the categories I went over, the cultural and everything. So what I'm going to uh, go over are your lists that might kind of look like this. So cultural. Virtually everyone on my street in South Chicago was African American. Most fathers worked in nearby steel mills, while most moms stayed at home to take care of the family. My father never worked at a steel mill. The thing is, most fa- most African American fathers actually run away from their children. I know, hate to, t- I hate to. If there are any African American fathers out there that didn't run away from your child, thank you so much for your absolute wondrous support. Because, boy, I don't know what the percentages are. I have to get those percentages, but it's a really sad percentage. Like my father and a lot of my friends' fathers and stuff like that, they all ran away. So, I mean, that would be wonderful if I actually had a father figure, but he was actually terrible. So. This, again, this is cultural. So our community was a tremendous support structure with neighbors and helping neighbors. Didn't have that. We actually had a racist neighbor when I was growing up when I was really, really young. He hated us. (laughs) And it's crazy because the librarian who worked at my elementary school, that was the wife of the husband who hated us because we were black. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. And just knowing that this was happening... In a very uh, kind of rundown area. Well, I know it wasn't rundown at the point until people started moving in. But yeah, it's just really, really funny. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Anyways, we ate traditional comfort foods, right? Uh, they, They could have been economical, but delicious in Philly. No one I knew owned a business. A business was something complicated and difficult. That was basically... I mean, if you if you say business... In my neighborhood, people would be like, business what? 
People are just trying to get by with a McDonald's job. Crazy, huh? How about economic? We lived in an older house that needed repair, but was in a safe neighborhood. My mom would deposit my dad's weekly paycheck and pay the bills and take out 25 cents for each of us kids as our allowance to do chores. I wish my mom would do that. We were considered the working poor, but I never knew that because our neighbors lived about the same way we did. That's a, that's a huge check mark for me. Yep, we were actually the working poor. I earn money doing odd jobs for other people. It wasn't a lot, but I always had pocket money to buy something pretty or get new clothes. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. The first time I got a big check, McDonald's convention, 2005. In two weeks, I made 1500 45000 baht. And you know what? When I got that money, plus another additional $300, $300 in just one day's work, my... Brother, again, extremely jealous, and we got in a huge fight, literally a fist fight. And it's crazy because it, everything always revolved around money. He wanted a piece of it. He wanted a piece of my money, but anytime I didn't give it to him, he went crazy. So I didn't know what money was until that 2005 when I actually had my own money. I bought my own clothes and everything. And by the time January came around in 2006, that money was gone. Pretty sad, huh? My parents, another thing that Lisa Nichols wrote in her book, she said, my parents had a checking account, a small savings account, but no investments. I never knew what the stock market was or how other people invested in it. Well, that's 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 a huge check mark. But the thing is, my mom never had a savings. OK, she never had investments. They didn't know what investments were. They had that. We were basically the working poor. She had a checking account to pay bills, put uh I uh, have clothes and everything and that – well, not clothes, but have food on the table. She just provided us with a place to stay, which was wonderful. But when, when August came around before the new new year and the new school year started, you know, she was trying to look at ways – you know, I remember back freshman year of high school, you know, uh, was in ninth grade. A lot of people here in Thailand would think of it as Mateom Sam, Mateom 3, which basically means grade 9 or ninth grade. Uh my mom didn't have a credit card. She didn't have anything to give us any clothes. So I had to wear the same clothes the year before. Yeah, that was not fun. Until she finally got her income tax check a month later and I was able to get clothes and stuff. But yeah, that was tough. That was really tough. Gender. My grandmother lived with us once. Grandpa Joe passed on. Okay, so she and my mom ran the household. So she no longer, Lisa Nichols, she no longer had a mother, I mean, a father figure within her household. It was actually her grandmother, grandmother Bernice. So, and how about, I was very good at creating relationships with other girls, my teachers and my neighbors. That's another one for gender. Another one that Lisa Nichols wrote down when I was a teen, a teenager, lots of employers offered jobs that were ideal for girls. Shit, I wish I had an ideal job. It wasn't till a particular individual said, Hey, do you want work? And it was actually one of my friends on the track and field team. And I said, yeah. He's like, okay, come on with me. You're part of my team. And his mother ran a wonderful business with people from Chicago. And I did a McDonald's convention, whereas I saw Australians, which was amazing because these particular Australians, guess what? It was put into my subconscious mind, people. In 2005, going to transition it into my senior year of high school. I met Australians for the first time, and they were the wildest, craziest people ever. They were all from Sydney, and it was, and it was part of this uh, McDonald's convention. And guess what? Within my subconscious mind somewhere, I ended up in Australia four years later, my first international travel, and I ended up moving there six years later. See, when you start piecing the puzzle together, you're going to be like, oh my God, this all makes sense. So... Anyways, I'm just piecing stuff together as I go. Gender, another one. My brothers teased me for getting A's in math and science. Girls aren't smart, they said. Thing is, my brother teased me for a lot of different things. Another one. No woman in my family ever went to college. Some never graduated uh, from high school, but got married instead. See, I was the second one. Second one in my generation to actually go to college and to graduate and stuff. So... Uh, but the thing is, my oldest sister, I don't know. No, no, she did now. She graduated now, which is awesome. Uh, and my youngest sister, yeah, she graduated too. She's, uh, she's going to be way ahead of us because she's going after her master's now. So I'm proud. I'm proud because my oldest sister, she set the tone for us. She opened the doors for us. I didn't open the doors for anyone, but my oldest sister did because in 2001, when I was 13 years old, I'm like, 